A little girl sat in her room. Her messy brown hair was pulled into little pigtails, and her hazel eyes stared at the door. She hugged her stuffed giraffe close to her little body and listened closely to the loud yells of her father and mother. I never should have had any damn kids, screamed a loud, deep voice. All they do is make messes, complain, draw on the walls. He was cut off by the high, angered yells of the girl's mother. They're children, David. They don't know any better. Oh, fuck me, Mary Beth. I don't want to hear your bullshit excuses. I've had just about enough with them. And what do you plan to do about it? The girl heard loud footsteps coming towards her room, and she hugged her giraffe closer. The door was violently opened, and in the hallway stood her large, angry, overweight father. In one of his meaty hands, he held a large textbook. Stop it, David! screamed her mother. But the father ignored his wife's pleading cries. He grabbed the little girl by the collar, and she screamed and kicked, trembling and shaking in fear. The girl's father harshly held up the textbook. This is for drawing on my fucking walls, you little bitch! Years later, the little girl known as Natalie was 17 years old. And like the usual, she sat in her room, watching TV. Her dad was ranting on about some economic crap that she really couldn't care less about as she munched on some popcorn. She was also currently drawing a picture. There was a bit of gore in it, but strangely, she really liked drawing blood. It gave her some weird satisfaction. Other than that, multitasking was no problem for her. It became apparent to her at a young age, after having to do so much hard work and labor, that she was able to do so many things at once. Drawing ended up being her talent and passion. It was her way of escaping from reality. And whenever something bad would rear its ugly head and peer in, or when she was simply bored. We're here. Having an annoyed tone, most likely from her sleeping, she looked at the large sign of the school that read, Walkerville Colligate Institute for the Creative Fine Arts. She sighed tiredly and stepped out, putting her backpack on her shoulder. See ya, she proclaimed, closing the car door. She walked into the school and chatted with a couple friends until she went up to her locker on the third floor. She grabbed her books, and before the five minutes of time was over... She ran to class. Her English teacher annoyingly put her hand on Natalie's desk. Where's your assignment, Miss Olette? Natalie swallowed. I, um... I forgot it at home. Sorry, Miss Homanick. She growled and stood. Your time is up, Miss Olette. Don't disappoint me. Natalie seemed puzzled by the thought for a moment. She didn't know why, but those words seemed to melt through her. She simply ignored it and went back to listening to the lesson. Falling asleep, not too long after, of course. Later that day, she was heading to her locker for fourth period when suddenly her boyfriend Chris came up to her. Hey, uh, talk to me after school, okay? She smiled lovingly at Chris. Though, strangely, she didn't suspect anything. He was always such a sweet guy. During her French class, she dared not to pay attention. Instead, she doodled the thing that she loved to draw. Blood, gore, people being stabbed, knives, and macabre things of the such. Other people would say that it was pretty dark of her to draw such things, but she saw nothing wrong with it. For a strange reason, it actually felt like a normal thing to her. Miss Olette! She quickly covered her doodles on her paper and looked up at her French teacher quickly, trying to hide her fear. Uh, yes, Mr. L. He gestured for her to move her arm with a slight turn of his head. Show me your work. She hesitantly moved her arm to show the picture of someone getting stabbed by an insane man. The teacher stared puzzled, looking at her a bit. She smiled nervously. Erase that and get started on your work he said in a strangely calm tone. He walked away, and she sighed and began to erase the picture. And Miss Olette, 
She looked at she looked up at him. Your time is almost up on getting your work done. I suggest doing it now. She growled at the remark. Time always seemed to be against her. As far as she cared, time could go fuck itself. And after class, she walked out of the school to find her boyfriend standing near the fence of the sidewalk. She smiled and walked over, hoping that her day could at least be cheered up by him. But as she walked closer, her smile faded. He wasn't smiling back. Chris, what's wrong? What did you want to talk about? Natalie, I think it's time that we, um... It's time that we should start seeing other people. She felt her heart break. But, but why? He gave her a stern look. It's your mindset. Your drawings. They just creep me out. I think it's it's really something wrong with you. And the saddest part is, is why you haven't told me why you're acting like this. It makes me feel irresponsible, so I I just I can't do it anymore. I'm sorry. And with that, he began to walk away. Natalie slammed her hands on the bathroom counter at home. She stared at herself in the mirror, her eyes twitching. I won't hurt myself like the others. I can stay strong. There was a needle and black thread in her hand. It's pointless. It doesn't help. Some weird sensation pulled at her subconscious. She chuckled slightly. No, I'm doing it because I want to. She held up the needle with thread on the end of it, and she smirked widely. Time is up. Piece after piece. Cut after cut. Even though excruciating pain was going through her, she did not whine. She did not whimper. She did not cry. There were no more tears to shed. All she did was smile. Blood leaked from the piercings and made a low, dripping noise into the sink and onto the counter. When she was finished, she stood back and admired her handiwork. She stroked the horrendous stitches on the side of her mouth that spread into a wide smile. She felt the warm, wet blood on her fingers and licked it gently, consuming the metallic-tasting liquid in pure ecstasy. She stopped when she saw her mother's reflection in the mirror behind her, and sharply turned around. She saw her mother's wide eyes and pale face, and she looked at her fingers, seeing the blood. She suddenly felt the pain. She started to cry. Mom? She had never felt so confused. What had just happened to her? Her mother had scheduled some therapy for her. Natalie had gotten rid of the stitches in fear of how much pain that it would bring, so she went to the therapist with them. She made sure that her hood was up as not to let anyone see. She sat down on the comfortable leather seat and stared at the blonde woman across from her in silence. Your name is Natalie, isn't it? Natalie just nodded. I'm Deborah, and I'm here to help. Now, tell me, what have been some of your problems recently? Natalie stared. Time. Time's been my problem. Deborah gave her a confused look. What about time, dear? Natalie's hands roughly gripped the leather of the seat. Everything. It makes you live through it. Slowly progressing through life, being controlled by society only to be tortured for seemingly to no end until you find that you no longer have a purpose. It's a vicious cycle. Time does not end. It doesn't slow down. It doesn't speed up. It's violent. 
It makes you live through the torture over and over again, unable to feel, unable to fast forward away from it. Natalie really had no idea what she had just said. She felt like she wasn't herself anymore. Could this be because of all the things that she had kept contained? No, it, it was impossible. But for this, some strange reason, she liked it. The therapist leaned closer. Sweetheart, I want you to tell me what's happened to you. Natalie still stared. There was a long pause. She smirked slightly, and the piercings from her stitches slightly opening again. Why don't you tell me, Blondie? You're the expert. Deborah seemed to have a bit of an annoyed look. I can't help you unless you tell me what's wrong, Natalie. Her fingers started to tear into the leather seats. Natalie isn't here anymore. With that, Deborah's eyes widened. She got up. I'll be right back. Please stay here. She walked out, leaving Natalie alone. Natalie did not move. She sat perfectly still, perfectly silent, and perfectly calm in her chair. And after a while of waiting and impatience, her parents finally walked in. She stood, happy to go, but she noticed her parents' expression. Even her father had a strange, saddened look on his face. Her confusion grew, but she said no words and followed them to their car. On the way there, she thought that she was going back home. She started to drift off. Strangely, she heard a dark voice speak in her dream. It almost sounded like herself, echoing into eternal darkness. Your time is up. She shot awake, some beads of sweat rolling down her face. She wasn't home. She wasn't in the car. She was in a bed. A white bed. In a white room. She looked to her side, seeing that she was hooked up to a heart monitor. She went to get up, but suddenly realized that she was bounded down. She panicked. She started to struggle and paused, hearing a door to her left open. A man in a white shirt looked at her, his hands behind his back. He almost looked like one of those cliché doctors that you would find in some scientific lab. She paid full attention as Mr. Scientist started to speak. You must be very confused right now, I can imagine. But I'm letting you know we're only here to help. Your parents agreed to sign a contract to give you some mental drugs to hopefully help your state of mind. She opened her mouth to protest, but was quickly silenced. You, you don't need to worry. You'll be back to normal in no time. Just try to relax. He walked over. And she tried to skittishly move away, but couldn't, due to the bonds of the leather straps around her wrists and legs. He carefully took a mask and put it over her mouth and nose. She stubbornly tried to get it off, but felt herself starting to slip under the drugs. And her eyes slowly shut. And suddenly, she woke up. She couldn't comprehend what the hell she was seeing. She was being given multiple injections. Even some things were being rubbed on her skin. She felt woozy, but was completely aware of her surroundings. She was entering a rare state in which some patients go through while undergoing surgery. They're able to see. They're being worked on. They can feel the pain. Their brain is active, but they can't respond. However, she was she was able to. Her heart rate on the monitor started to speed up. The doctors took notice of this. They looked at her, seeing her opened eyes. One of the doctors was yelling at another. She couldn't make out what they were saying, but she suddenly felt a rush of adrenaline. She slowly started to slip through her bonds, shaking violently. One of the doctors was going to hold her down, but was suddenly hesitant of doing so, and all three of the doctors backed away. She sat on the edge of the bed now and ripped the mask and tube from her arm. She got up, started to stumble towards them. 
Her breathing hitched, and her vision was blurry. She could make out herself giving off a couple of insane chuckles, but suddenly she felt a searing pain in her chest. She gripped where her heart would supposedly be and dropped to her knees, but coughed blood and fell on the floor, completely blacking out. She woke slowly and groggily after that. She was back in bed and the doctors were sitting beside her. Something went horribly wrong. She didn't know why, but she felt a tremendous amount of hatred towards the doctor. He took notice of it and looked away. You weren't supposed to wake up while we were giving you the doses for your mental state. We aren't sure how it affected you, but we have a feeling we're going to find out. He paused for a second, before taking out a small mirror, not looking at her. It happened to have an effect on your appearance as well. She looked at herself in the mirror. Her eyes widened her eyes. They were completely green. She noticed that she still had the stitches in her mouth as well, but for some reason, she couldn't help but feel happy. Her heart rate started to increase again. She gave out a low chuckle. <laughs> the doctor looked in shock, seeing that she was suddenly already standing over him. Doctor, she said, still chuckling. He trembled slightly, pressing a button from under the monitor. Yes? Your time is up. A loud scream was heard through the halls of the apparent hospital. Two security guards rushed into the room, kicking open the door. Blood was the first thing that they saw. Blood on the walls, on the bed, on the floor. Hell, even on the ceiling. Natalie had taken the doctor and strapped him down into the bed. His spine was completely snapped as the bed was bent almost into a sandwich. Blood poured from his eyes, nose, mouth, and just about every orifice of his body. And there, in the corner, was the murderer, happily drawing her gruesome pictures on the wall in blood, followed by the phrase, Your time is up. She slowly turned to look at them. A wide, crazy grin spread across her face. Hello, friends. Would you like to play? The orderlies quickly pulled out syringes when she charged at one of them, quickly able to dodge his strike. She grabbed the pocket knife from one of them and slashed it right across the waistline. Blood, organs, flooded out, and he collapsed to the ground. She inhaled deeply, loving the damp stench of death. The other shook his head with fear, dropping his syringe. She slowly walked up to him and placed the tip of the knife at his chest. Your time is up. She slowly slid the knife down, all the way to the end of his gut. His organs spilled out onto the floor as well, and he collapsed, dead. Natalie's mother was silently sleeping in her room next to her husband. She awoke to the sound of some knocking on her door. She groggily got up and walked out of the bedroom to the front door. It was pouring outside and thunder boomed in the distance. She walked up to the door and, pre and paused when she was about to grab the knob. There was a faint sound of laughter. The rain and thunder seemed to be quiet suddenly. She pressed her ear against the door and listened closely. Hello, mother. Natalie burst through the door, wielding two knives in hand. Her mother stumbled back, hitting her head against the coat rack. One of the knobs broke into her skull, and she bled violently from the back of her head onto the floor. She fell to the ground, paralyzed, but still conscious. 
Natalie towered over her, but slowly knelt down to meet the level of her eyes and showed her two knives covered in thick, red blood. I was suffering, Mother. She ran the tip of the knives across her cheek, cutting it slightly. Natalie tilted her head. You were weak. You did nothing. All her mother could do was shake and gasp constantly, like a fish on a line, and Natalie grabbed her mother and gently set her down, so her back was laying flat on the ground. She proceeded to stand on top of her and started to make a V-cut into her chest. Her mother only gasped and shook, but her breath started to seem choked and gurgle. Natalie knew that she didn't have much time left. She proceeded to forcibly open her chest cavity with a loud crack and reached inside and grabbed her mother's heart as it slowly beat in her hand. Its pulses were growing dimmer and dimmer and suddenly she ripped it out, blood spraying all over her face. She stared at her mother directly as she slowly died. Sweet dreams, she said to her mother's corpse. Your time was up. She put the heart in her mother's mouth, patting her cheek softly, and stood up. She wasn't done yet. Natalie's father, David, had stirred awake and realized that his wife had not returned. His eyes started to adjust to the darkness when he suddenly realized Natalie. Standing on his bedside, smirking crazily, with her green eyes glowing in the darkness. Blood was all over her and the scent was unbearable. She put on a fake sad face. Oh dear, mother's gone. I wonder who will get the money. <laughs> she suddenly grabbed her father's forehead. That's all you ever cared about, is it? That's all you ever cared about anyway. Her father, however, was a fighter, and he sprung up and grabbed her by the neck and threw her to the ground. He started to stomp on her chest until she coughed blood and stared down at her. Does, doesn't it feel good, Daddy? She coughed up more blood. After all, you never seemed to mind doing it all those years ago, did you? He narrowed his eyes. You aren't my daughter. A wide smirk spread across her face, and she looked at him with her glowing eyes as blood dripped down her mouth. You're right. I'm not. She suddenly tripped him, causing him to fall hard on the floor. She got up, knives in hand. They say the bigger you are, the harder you fall. While he was winded, she grabbed the pillow and stuffed it in his face and started to stomp on it, harder and harder, hearing loud cracking noises after a while. And when she pulled the pillow away, his face was gruesomely mutilated. He was making muffled noises, crying in pain. What's the matter, Daddy? Pain too much for you? She stabbed both knives into his stomach, leaving them there for now as she ripped off one of the large, heavy wooden poles from the bed. She set it down on his leg and took out the knife. Gonna need these, she chuckled. Suddenly, she started to pull back while sitting down, and the weight from her body on the pole slowly started to squeeze his innards up through his body. He started to gag, and blood poured from his mouth. His breath was silenced, and she hit a bit of a snag. Come on. As she forced herself to pull back with more weight, and suddenly his organs burst from his mouth. The nasty gore piled onto the floor on the sides of his face, and she noticed his carcass. And walked out. Your time was up. Finally, this would be her favorite part. She quietly snuck down to her brother's room. Silently opening the door, blood dripping from the knife, making a low tapping sound as the droplets hit the hard wood. Her brother wasn't in bed. It was apparent that he must be hiding somewhere. And she grinned. Oh dear brother, come now. She started to walk inside. All I want to do is have a little fun. As she stepped in more, she listened closely for any sounds, any breathing, any movement. She even sniffed the air for his putrid scent, and the closer that she listened, she finally noticed something. A faint breathing noise. 
Whack! She fell to the ground, trembling. Her brother was behind her with a now bloody baseball bat. He was glaring down with anger, panting in rage. And she tried to slowly get up, but he hit her again and again and again. Mother always did like you best, you bitch. He hit her hard one last time before taking a breather. And she was bleeding heavily. Her green eyes drooped, glowing faintly in the darkness. She felt weak and looked closer up at the ceiling. She recalled the days that she had spent in here, being tortured, having to go through it for four years, looking at the same damn ceiling. It sent a sudden rush of energy into her body, and she started to stand, laughing insanely. Her brother went to hit her again, but she used both of her knives to block it. You're going to hell, brother. With a large push, she sent her brother flying onto the bed, and he hit his head against the wall and growled angrily, about to lunge at her when she stabbed the two knives into his arms, keeping them pinned into the wall. He screamed and struggled. Let's see what we can use here. She started walking around the room and smirked, seeing a simple butter knife on his bedside. She picked it up and walked over to him. They say that the eyes are the softest organs on the body. She licked the knife, soft as butter. He looked in horror, trying to get away. As she started to dig out his eyes with the knife, he shrieked loudly, and she and she quickly tied a cloth around his mouth. Now, now, can't have you waken the neighbors. He wasn't able to see anything. The pain was unbearable. Blood leaked violently from his eye sockets. He would cry, but was now incapable. Hmm. She dug around for more items and picked up a pair of scissors. She walked over to him, crawling over him. I think you need to cut loose, brother. She stabbed the scissors into his gut, and he cried out in a muffled scream of pain. She treated him like an arts and crafts, cutting through his skin like paper. She lifted up his large intestines and smirked violently. You know what I love? Macaroni art. He started to cut the intestines into sections. These might be a little bit too big to put on a plate, though. She could hear his brother foaming blood from his mouth. However, he had to swallow the blood back because of the cloth. Doesn't that taste good? She licked his blood off of her fingers. I sure know that I like it. He let out another muffled scream. She went down to his toes and started cracking them and ripping them off one by one. After a while, his scream was grew futile. His throat was raw and bloody by now. Next, she worked on his fingers, snapping them, ripping them off. The gurgling became louder, and he started to squirm. He was choking on his own blood. She pulled the cloth down, and blood poured from his mouth, and turned his head to the side to vomit violently. There, there, brother, she said, patting his head. Eat this and feel better. She stuffed one of his fingers into his mouth, making it jam into his throat. He choked. And died. Your time was up. The girl, known as Natalie, walked into her room, dripping blood. Off to the corner she saw it, her stuffed giraffe. She knelt down and stared at it. Then, without a word, she stood back up, walked to the bathroom, Staring at herself, covered in blood, she heard a faint ticking noise. She looked down and saw a pocket watch. She stared at it, hands slowly turning, listening to the ticking for what seemed like an eternity. She took out one of her new knives as it heavily dripped blood onto the counter. She grabbed the pocket watch and disassembled the watch until only the small clock was left. Time makes you live through torture, she said slowly, bringing the knife up to her eye, slowly progressing through life, being controlled by society. She started to slowly dig it into her eye as the vision in her left eye grew blurry and red, until you find that you no longer have a purpose. She felt her eye start to relent from its socket, blood pouring in the sink. It's a vicious circle. She felt it dangle out of her socket, a sharp pain where it connected to her head. 
time does not speed up. It does not slow down. It is violent. She grabbed onto the cord of her eye and tore it out. The eye falling into the sink. It makes you live through the torture over and over again. She started to place the clock at her eye, unable to fast forward away from it. There was a squishing sound and drips of blood until it seemed like the clock fit perfectly in her socket. I am clockwork. The young girl, used to be known as Natalie, walked away from her burning house. The flames engulfed everything, and inside the giraffe slowly burned, along with the corpses of her family. Some say that she still lives on, carrying her insanity with her, leaving so many dead, saying that she decided when their time should come to an end. And the only way to detect her presence is if you're cuddled in close in the covers at night, sleeping soundly. And in the darkness she's watching, she determines. You hear ticking, and you see a green flash of that putrid clock eye. If she's there, you know your time is up. <laughs>